My name's Rob Badger. I'm a conservation photographer. Uh, my sweetie Nita and I are working on a project called Beauty and the Beast, Wildflowers and Climate Change. And what we're trying to do is what you're talking about here. Um, I've been photographing environmental problems, environmental disasters since 1980. It started with the uh, Inyo Valley when LA was trying to uh, pump more water out of the Owens Valley uh, to supply the growing needs of uh, LA. I've photographed uh, mining disasters, uh, oil spills, and I just got to the overload, the, the emotional overload point again where I can't do this anymore. I would be so angry, I'd cry. So I kind of just stumbled on wildflowers and found out that virtually everyone loves flowers. So if we get people's attention up and try to engage them in something they already love, get their attention and then get them to read an essay in our book about what climate change is doing, what population is doing, the history of public lands, how, uh, as a country, we believe we own these public lands. So it's about getting people to recognize something they love because what we love, we protect. What we value, we love, and what we love, we protect. So, you know, what you're saying is so important. How do we engage people in a poetic, almost romantic, spiritual way to get their attention and then act to do something? Uh, so a question I've got, I don't know how many people know the difference between the, the protected status between a national park, a national monument, national forest, and BLM land. Because in a national park, everything's sacred. In national monuments, you can mine BLM land. I mean, all these things. So it may be important for people to know how the protection is related to these, these different government entities. So I, I love what you're doing. I'm so grateful. <laughs> Thank you. Mary Ellen, Mary Ellen will be, have an essay about citizen scientists in our book. Oh, and one more thing. We are looking for authors of color, um, uh, not, a, not white people. Uh, I'm sorry, we already have the quota <laughs> fulfilled. Uh, but to write in our books. We have a collection of different essays. We want to reach as broad in our audience as possible. So anyone can talk to us later about what we're doing and why we need these authors. Thank you. I just want to say one thing about the, um, to, to, to complete something that, um, that Mary Ellen said about um, monuments and Zinke's, Zinke's uh, survey is now finished. And what I'm, what I'm seeing now is what I think are like trial balloons. Because he has described what it, the three he wants to work on. He's picked three. One is um, Bears Ears, which just happened. There's just, I spent the last couple of years going down to Colorado with Navajos, Hopi, Zuni, and I know how much the Colorado River, know how much they care about this. Bears Ears, they just got it. After all this effort, right. he's going he's gonna to plug it. Es uh, Escalante, the staircase, he's, he's going to hit a big, big, beautiful one that, that Clinton put in, and he's talking about one in Oregon. But I, I, I think that doesn't seem so bad, given all the money we have, but I think they're like trial balloons, and I think if, if he succeeds on any one of those, it's a terrible precedent, because a national monument, you're talking about the different distinctions, is slightly ambiguous. It doesn't have the strong organic act protection that a national park does. So, so it's very important not to start losing these monuments and, and to really resist. Join the tribes, because they're going to come out against Bears Ears and, and Escalante. And the tribes are getting stronger. After, even before Standing Rock, they're, they're, the tribes are, are really getting together in a way they never did. You know, the, the, us pale faces were always good at, at making divisions among them. We, it was, we, we divided and conquered. And it's finally, I mean, and, and that went all through the last century. Indians were sniping at each other, like environmentalists. They're always, you know, faulting the people of a slightly different persuasion in the environmental movement. So, so the, uh, that's important. Other questions? Thank you. Um, woman with the glasses and the. Um, well, I have a really loud voice. <laughs> so um, I was wondering if either one of you have anything to say about two issues population and pros and cons of technology. 
Well, you know, I will say, I, I have lunch with Paul Ehrlich. Do you know who he is? Yeah. I have lunch with Paul Ehrlich about every six weeks or so. And I, I met him first about four years ago when I was researching this book because I, I chose like six basic um, you know, mechanisms of nature that are really kind of pinch points where extinction is happening. And he's a population biologist, became very famous in the 70s for writing The Population Bomb. But he also is really famous as a scientist for quantifying co-evolution, which is the way that plants, um, at species co-evolve traits in tandem with other, other species. So the example that he used was butterflies and plants. They co-evolve traits together. The reason a butterfly is the way it is is because of the, the host plant that it co-evolved with. So I'm asking him to explain to me, you know, co-evolution and how did you uncover this? And he, he very sweetly says, I will tell you about co-evolution, but I must, you must promise me that when you write about it, you will say that the real problem is overpopulation of humans and, and overconsumption of resources. And it's true. So I've, I've asked myself all the time, like, what the hell is wrong with us? Like, why are we proliferating so much? This is bad. It doesn't seem adaptive. Like, there, certainly there are examples in nature where you will have a boom in population, a population boom that then leads to a bust because the boom, like, they overeat their, their habitat and then the population busts. So we think we're so smart, right? We think we're so smart, and so, but we're doing that. And I interviewed Richard Dawkins, do you all know who he is? I interviewed him a few weeks ago and he said something that has really struck with me, I've been thinking about it, which is that you know we are perfectly evolved for the past. So he said, all of us are the result of a successful sexual reproductive act, right? But that is unusual, like going back you know, 100,000 years, most of what would be homo sapiens or were homo sapiens did not live long enough to complete a successful reproductive act. So we're still kind of behaving as though we were 100,000 years ago with increasing we're, this instinct for increasing ourselves. And so we're not adapted for the present or for the future. We're adapted for the past. This is a problem. So this is a huge problem because the way we're going to learn is going to be so ugly. And this is what, you know, this is what I'm trying to, like, let's not learn it that ugly way. Let's learn it the better way, which is anticipate that this is going to happen and change our behavior before millions of people die or millions of people starve or things get even uglier than they are for many people. So technology is so complicated, right? Technology is tool making. It's tool making. A compass is technology. We are driven by our technology. We, we invent these tools that then change the way that we live. There's immense capacity for technology to do a lot of really good things for conservation. Like there's an, a now a way to, to do gene manipulation. So for example, you could manipulate the, the genes of an invasive species and keep it from reproducing so that you could stop an invasive species from ruining an ecosystem without pouring any poison on anybody. So there's, there's all kinds of things that technology can help us do, but technology is tools. It's not a plan, and it's not a comprehension of a problem. I also think that people always forget that there are trade-offs with every technology. I mean, you can do that with invasive species, but who knows what the downstream consequences will be. And that goes yeah. back to, I think, what you both were talking about earlier, which is this kind of hubris and arrogance that we can figure it out and anticipate all of the feedback loops in this incredibly complicated system that you know we call planet Earth. And you know, just I actually, I actually think, excuse me, I actually think your two questions are sort of connected in, in the sense that, in the sense that I think we've lost ground in our understanding in the society of those two things. In the 60s, in the environmental movement, it was a truism that if we do not solve this, com this population problem, all these other things we're doing, preservation of landscape, you know, um, clean air, clean water, it's all gone. This is the problem we absolutely, the underlying problem we have to solve. I think people were, especially in the environmental community, were much more aware of that now, then, than they are now. And I think the same is true of technology. I, I disagree with Marianne a little bit on, on technical, technological fix. I think we believed we had come to 
persuade people that there's not going to be a technological fix. It's, it's, it's a pie in the sky and it's a, almost a dangerous illusion that we're going to get out of this by technology because technology got us in this. And, and all these suggestions, an awful lot of them are not very good suggestions of how to get out of it. So uh, I think there's a new belief in the te technological fix. And I think it has something to do with how wonderful these toys are in this new generation. They, all these wonderful th things we have, with these phones that do these amazing things, why not, why not um, believe that we can solve our problems technologically? It's because they're much more complicated than a cell phone. You know, the problems that are, that are facing us. And I think the disturbing thing to be about the movement is the movement on, an, on population especially has, the movement knows this is true, but it's afraid to talk about it. They're afraid to be called racists. And, and because the movement now has gotten very beltway and very sort of wonkish, uh, they want to make alliances. This is what the Sierra Club did. It doesn't talk population anymore. My dad, my dad published the population bomb, Ehrlich's population bomb, back in the 68. Uh, since then, the world population has doubled. That's an extraordinary That's crazy. figure. In my lifetime, it's tripled. And there are people, Marxists, who tell you, well, it's just a, a distribution problem. They're, they're, they're totally crazy. It's, a, it's an absolute, absolute numbers problem. In my lifetime, 72 years, it's tripled. How can, how, this, nothing like that's ever happened before. So we've got to talk about it again. We, we, we can't, can't be afraid of, of making our, immigra our immigrant advocates mad at us because it's too important. We can't be bullied out of talking about something that's very important. Okay, one more question. Uh, gentleman in the back. divide and conquer and Mr. Brower brought it up earlier about trying to get people bring people into the movement and what I see happening in America versus what's happening in what happened in northern Europe where they they pay they have a tax base that takes care of the everyday problems of people uh, such as education shelter uh, child care etc cetera, etc cetera. whereas here we have such a divided country that it's hard to get involved. I mean, people can't even be here tonight. You see who's here is probably people like me that are retired or, but people cannot get involved in a movement when they have so many fragments going on in their life that they can't handle even those. So that's what we need to do, I think. And I want you to, want you to comment on that. What I'm saying now, for I'm all crazy or is this right? Do you agree with me? Well, no, I think you're, I, I think we don't know how to to grapple with the different scales of different problems that we have. You're right, I mean, and I think that the way people are living in their homes tonight, it's 7.15, so let's say in California, people are having dinner if they're lucky. And, and yet even very affluent people feel an, a sense of urgency of survival. And we do have a kind of culture where you have to kind of constantly be Get doing better in order to stay in place. So it creates a sense of, of being under the gun all the time and not really having margins for, for anything bigger. People are very, I always say, like, I want people to, to tell upper middle class white moms and dads that if their kids did citizen science, it would get them into Harvard. <laughs> because then they would all do it. <laughs> like they're all running around the state of California all the time with their kids on soccer teams. What are they doing that for? That's, they're not going to play professional soccer and yet they're devoting their entire lives to playing soccer. So it's like this competitive advantage everybody's always looking for. Let's make, you know, saving the environment your competitive advantage. But here's again why citizen science is so cool because it is a template for actually putting different dimensions of scale into the same picture. So wherever you're at, there's a, way to, there's a way to conceptualize it and then communicate it. And you know, this is, it is technology that makes it possible. But you know, citizen science existed long before technology. It's about direct observation. It's about you personally observing, making observations, and very importantly, making note of your observations. 
So, you know, that's where my hope is that we really do have the capacity that this, even the very, very cutting edge technology of that citizen science is, it's big data science, actually has these very ancient roots in indigenous cultural, traditional ecological knowledge, and, um, and that we are finding a way to reintegrate some of the better ways we have of approaching an integrated life. But we have all these people, we have all these countries, we have all these nationalities. It's a lot to integrate, it's a lot to put together. Um, one more question. Um, but, um, what I'm listening to as a creative writers is a, a, a developing the style of the emotional existentialism. That is where you Fair enough. Personally confront the death issue in that. In fact, that's how we become knowing human beings because we know what will make us go on living and what will uh, stop our existence. Um, that's the three elements of first we freeze, we observe to see if we're going to have to fight or if we're going to have to flee to live another day. Um, out of that, I, uh, that confronting this <coughs> coming mass death, Maybe. possible extinction, of humanity, this is all on the table now. Um, we have to. I, I just cut to the greater issue. I think we have to conquer, we have to defeat poverty, world poverty. That's the basic issue. You defeat poverty, control corruption. Corruption is always going to be with us, and abolish war actually carrying weapons and killing another person, othering another, making them enemy. Those are three big conditions, but that's the only way that I see that we're going to save the world or keep the climate that we have with breathing. Otherwise, we will be like the, say, the uh, Berlin population in World War II at the end of the war. Bombed. Men, uh, women, children, wounded soldiers facing a, an onslaught of uh, the uh, Russian army, Tommy Gun Brigade, coming in uh, undefended. What could they do? They stayed in place and they just took it. Those that divide, those of women were raped and so on. They just took it because they wanted to live another day and they recreated their society and their city. If, um, is there a question or? Uh, yeah, the, the question <laughs> is, is, is that um, can we accept the, the moral condition of that we have greed, anger, and ignorance? And you've spoken to the ignorance, you know, that it, we're trying to curb the ignorance of showing the people that it goes beyond their person, their day-to-day -day existence. But otherwise, uh, can we, can we, we can't show that. Well, you know, one, one, there's, you you raise many issues and, um, which are, you know, all really valid and interesting and, and relevant. You know, in, in certain conservation biology worlds, the, the general view about what's happening is that it has seemed kind of as inevitable, and I don't know if it is or not, that, that we're gonna be putting like two billion more people on the earth by about 2040. And part of why that is, is because of countries that are impoverished, have people who, who, who have 10, 12 children as a way of hedging, because they want, that's how they've done it. You know, again, to Richard Dawkins' point, they're adapted to the past, not to the present. And that it will take, you know, at least a generation for those um, those countries, those those the peoples that do that, to understand that actually now their children they have a chance for their children to live. So if they have only two or three children, those children will live. So there's no need to have the ten children, the fifteen children. Now, so that's like a lag. So the, in certain conservation communities, they're looking at like, okay, so there's this lag that's going to happen, and the point is we have to get species through that pinch point. 
because people will be converting habitat to feed all those people. We will have excess people before, before population levels off. So population is actually leveling off in the United States as we have a more affluent um, and, and healthier population that knows if you have two children, it's likely they will live. So you don't need to have more. Um, so that's one model. I, I tend to not want to believe that it's a fait accompli that we have to add those two billion on. I hope that we don't do that. But and a lot of the things, you know, I think it is really to Richard Dawkins' point that we are adapted to the past. That's warfare, rape, um, you know, scarcity of resources. These are conditions of the past that we do not have to have today. So we have to quickly get adapt to the conditions we really do have, which is that if we distribute what we have more evenly to the poverty issue, um, there's enough for everybody. This, okay. this presumes that, uh, that, that humans can collectively ask, act rationally. Well, it's true. You know, th there's, not, there's not a whole lot of evidence. And, there's and no you, evidence of that If you that had to all. ask me, I would, I would say when you say, are we, we're, gonna, we're gonna ban war, we're gonna ban poverty. My guess is that both those things are going to be with us forever. Uh, it's a horrible thing to say. On population, and I'm about to contradict what I just said, but um, my dad used to say on population, you cannot continue to make predictions there'll be two billion more because this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And, and people don't quite understand that. They say, well, we're just being pra practical. You're really not. You cannot continue to make prophecies like that because they will happen um, because people start to build, build for, for that. So... Um, um, Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. On that note, I'm going to wrap up. Um, thank you all for coming, and thank you, San Francisco Library, for hosting this. Thank you, Susan.